Johnny Dollar. This is Harry McQueen, Johnny, up here in Gloucester, Mass. McQueen? That's right, Four State Mutual. Oh, sure, Harry. How are you? What's on your mind? Johnny, I have a real funny one for you. Okay, so I'm laughing. Oh, I mean funny peculiar, you know. Do I? Why don't you tell me about it? We'll see. Well, it appears that somebody is threatening the life of one of our clients. You call that funny? Uh, I, I told you, Johnny. Yeah, you told me. Uh, what's the name of this client? Amos R. Weatherby, an all-retired sea captain. Lives in a little town of Anna's Farm, up on Cape Ann. How much insurance is he carrying? Uh, 50000 straight life. And who's the beneficiary? His pretty young niece, Thelma Jane Weatherby. Oh? Uh, she lives with him, uh, sort of takes care of him. But she just can't wait for him to die a natural death. Hmm? No, wrong, Johnny. He's the one who called me about it a few minutes ago. Asked that you be set up there. Eh, well, now, Harry, you know as well as I do that if she's smart... And she is. And if she has got any intentions, the best way to keep suspicion from herself. Wrong again, Johnny. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Uh, just wait till you see and talk to her. Well? Hmm. Young, did you say? In her late 20s. And, uh, pretty? Very. The most gorgeous girl I think I've ever seen. Okay, then, Harry, give me the address and telephone her that I'm on my way. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Mutual Insurance Company, Gloucester, Massachusetts office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the boat out of the blue matter. Knowing the Cape Ann country pretty well, I decided to use my own car on this one. So, expense account item one, 1470 mileage at the rate of 10 cents a mile and a bargain for the company at half the price. Anisquam on the northwestern end of the Cape is a pleasant little settlement, unspoiled by the vacation crowds. A kind of quiet summer haven for writers, poets, and painters, with a few large and very old homes. The address that Harry McQueen gave me turned out to be one of them. Set on a high, sandy knoll, it was a big frame house with hip roof, shingled turrets, and cupolas, half a dozen gables and dormer windows, all of it dripping with gingerbread and covered with Boston ivy. It looked out over the sparkling blue waters of Enniswam Bay. On one corner was a big tower with a platform on top surrounded by a heavy, well-polished brass railing. A flagpole carried not only the national ensign, but a couple of signal flags on separate lines below a sort of yard arm, I guess you'd call it. Another shorter pole supported a weather vane and one of those revolving things to measure wind velocity. The whole place, in spite of its weather-beaten age, was in good condition. It was what the owner, according to Harry's description of them, would probably call ship-shaped. All very interesting and colorful. What interested me most, though, was the vision that greeted me at the front door. And I mean vision. Yes. Oh, you must be Johnny Dollar. Any description of Thelma Jean Weatherby could only end up in the Department of Understatement. She was tall, well tanned, and beautiful. A sort of honey blonde with clear, exciting blue eyes. The sort of figure that you dream about. She was wearing a well cut pair of blue silk capris. Johnny? And a blouse of lighter blue chiffon. The freshening breeze caught a wisp of her hair and gently flicked it across that beautiful face in a sort of caress. I caught the faint scent of our page. Johnny, what's the matter with you? Huh? You are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I'm sorry, Miss Weatherby. Miss Weatherby? Uh, Thelma? Thelma Jean. But come in, Johnny. Yeah, sure. The captain has just gone up to the bridge to look for the weather so we can talk safely. The captain? My uncle, Captain Amos Weatherby. Oh, boy. And the bridge is on that tower on the corner of the house. I see. He spends most of his time up there. 
It was about Captain Amos that I called the insurance company. So McQueen told me. Sit down, Johnny. And would you like a nice cool drink or something after your long drive? Well, I, I take it you'd like to tell me what this is all about while the captain isn't here, so why don't we save the amenities for later, huh? All right. I can tell you all about it in two minutes. All right. Uh, I was engaged to a fellow. That I can believe. His name was Roger Burton. Until a couple of weeks ago when the captain, who didn't like Roger from the start, well, he found out some rather unsavory things about him. Like what, Thelma Jean? Roger never told me, Johnny, but he'd been married. Twice, as a matter of fact. And both of his wives died under very funny circumstances. I see. Also, they both had considerable money. Which I will, if anything ever happens to Captain Amos. So I understand. His insurance. So I not only broke off with him, but Captain Amos literally threw him out of the house. And believe me, in spite of his age, he could do it. And now? Well, before he left, Roger told Captain Amos he'd get even with him. He said that he'd kill him. You mean just like that? Yes. He even boasted that he could do it and get away with it. The same as he did with a couple of nosy wives. Those were his very words. Hmm. Oh, you have no idea what a horrible person he became after the captain showed him up. It was like a maniac. Well, then you're lucky to be free of him. You bet I am. It'll be a long time before I fall for any sweet talk again. Oh, it'll be a terrible waste, Norma Jean. What? Yeah, I like you. Oh, Johnny, not you. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Or am I? You better be. And yet, if all the stories I've heard about well, you are true... Well, I one of them. And to prove that I didn't come up here just because Harry McQueen said you're the most beautiful, the most gorgeous Mr. girl. McQueen told you that? I'm sure I'd a thousand percent. But then now... if I'd known that, and if you hadn't come... I'd never have forgiven you. Yeah, but now let's get down to what... Especially after what he said over the phone about you. Like what? Oh, that uh, you're an old, dull, dodgy, pedantic... Well, I'll bumbling. sue him. <laughs> and I'll certainly try to prove otherwise. But right now... Now, Johnny. Now, let's get down to business. Well? Well, after the captain threw him out, we thought that was the last we'd see of Roger, in spite of what he'd said. In spite of his threat. What? Johnny, somebody has been prowling around outside this house at night. I've only caught glimpses of him, of his shadow, really. But I'm sure it's Roger Burton. It can only mean one thing, Johnny. He's here to carry out his threat against Captain Amos. <laughs> Roger Burton, you've seen prowling around the place? Yes, Johnny, and only at night. And he's supposed to have done it from, to have gone out west or something. Now, don't you see what that means? That he's going to carry out his threat to kill Captain Amos. And he's got to stop him somehow. If you're right about all this. Oh, if you knew what a terrible person he is. Mm. And yet you were engaged to be married to him. Well, that was before the captain showed him up for what he really is, a wife killer. Well, you admit yourself it's never been pinned on him. Because he's clever. That's why he boasted that he could kill my uncle and get away with it. And now that I've seen him here... Johnny? He hasn't made his presence around here known to anyone else, though, Jean. Well, I'm sure he doesn't know that I've seen him. But now well, just, it. just what has he done? All I know is that I've seen him, or his shadow, poking around outside in the yard between here and the cell. Then last the cell? Night... What's that? Look, you can see it from this window. Yeah. There. That concrete building, whatever it is, at the edge of the property? It used to be a kind of jail back in the days of the sailing ship. Now the power company uses it for transformers or whatever you call them. Yeah, I see the power cables leading down from the pole. I've looked for his footprints out there in the morning, but there's always a wind at night. So... Maybe I'd better take a look in that little that cell, as you call it. Oh, it's all locked up, Johnny. And the tiny windows with the bars over them are so dirty you can't see a thing inside. Have you any reason to think he's somehow got into the... Hey, that storm's really coming this way. Yes, and Captain Amos will love it. But not well, Johnny. hadn't you better get him down off that tower before it hits? During the storm? Why, you couldn't drag him down with a turn mule team. Oh. Take him back to the old days when he used to ride out a storm on the open bridge of a sailing ship. 
Thelma Jean, does he know about Roger showing up again? No, Johnny, I haven't told him. But listen, I've been trying to tell you. Tell me what? That I not only heard him prowling around last night, but this morning I found some ladder marks in the ground. Where? Out beside the tower. As though he'd use those long ladders to get up to it from the outside. Ladder marks? I don't know what else they could be. This color, and for the moment we'll assume that it is Roger Burton. Oh, I'm sure of it. He's made no attempt to enter the house. Oh, he's smart for that. And don't forget, Johnny, he doesn't know that I've seen him around again. Hmm. Well, before this storm really breaks, Thomas Jean, I'm going to take a look at that transformer building out there and see if... And you better hurry, Johnny, before... Thelma oh. Jean! Thelma Jean! Yeah, Captain? Where are you? In here. Well, in combination, did you put my salvation up? <laughs> it's up in the cabin, just below the bridge where it always is. I told you storm was making up. It's going to be a big one. Now you got to get me back on the bridge before... Well, now who's this, Thelma Jean? Captain, this is Johnny Dollar. Dollar, huh? Hiya, Captain Amos. Another crooked landlubber come here to trouble you? Oh, no, no, Captain. Johnny, well, just an old friend who dropped in. Yeah? With the storm coming up, I... Big one, I tell you. Been in all the papers. But me, I told you it was on the way five, six days ago. The way the barometer on the bridge has been behaving. Yes, I know. So I've asked Johnny to stay for the night. Oh, well, whatever me little girl wants, Selma Jean, you know that. But, Johnny? Yes, sir. You do anything to hurt me little girl, and by Jupiter, I'll kill her, you. Oh, don't worry, Captain. All right. Paul Wester's in the cabin up there? Aye, sir. And I'll see you below here when the storm's over. I'll bring your dinner up to you. Oh, will I ride another storm? <laughs> don't be silly, woman. Aye, sir. Johnny, if you're going out to look at that cell... First, I want you to show me where you found the letter marks, okay? Aye, sir. The marks in the ground were still quite plain at the base of the ivy-covered tower. The ladder must have been a tall one, high enough to reach the platform that the captain called the bridge. And I found rather a couple of things. A heavy lightning rod extended up the side of the tower, well hidden by the ivy. But the bottom of it had been sawed off, making it useless. Also hidden by the ivy was a wire, an insulated copper wire. Too heavy to cut without tools, but certainly not big enough to take a lightning bolt. The wire was lashed to the upper section of the lightning rod. The other end disappeared in the ground at my feet. And it led away toward the cell, the little transformer station. It was dark now, and the storm was building up fast. I dashed back into the house, up to the second floor, and then up the winding stairway to the captain's bridge. You better lash yourself under the rail, Johnny. This wind will blow your feet off of the deck into the sea. Looks like you're right, sir. I told her this northeaster is going to be a big one in the east, Johnny. There might be a one night off the eight dollars. That was fast. It... What are you doing there, Johnny? This upper end of the lightning rod was six or eight feet from the side of the tower, held there by big insulators. But again, the heavy copper wire, again hidden by the ivy. It connected the rod with the brass railing where the captain was holding on for dear life against the wind. And it meant that the railing was the cleverest, most diabolical instrument for murder that I had ever seen. Captain Amos. Listen to her bluff, Johnny. Listen, we've got to go below. Hello, and miss a storm like this? Come on, come on, in a thunder like this, dear you. Listen to me, and keep away from that rail. I'll call this rail, it'll blow us into the sea. I tell you, get away from that keep rail. Keep your hands off me, you lover of young Sorry. I dragged him off his so-called bridge and down into the little room below, then hoisted him onto my shoulder and started down the circular stairway. What happened to him? I'm afraid I had to knock him out. What? To get him off that platform up there. No, Johnny, you shouldn't have. You'll never forgive you for... For what? For preventing him from getting electrocuted? Oh. Better, better give him some brandy or something. Oh, Johnny, don't you understand? Didn't you see the lightning rod up there? You bet I did. Right next to the platform. And while you're at it, you can bring a slug of that for me. Oh. Don't you understand? Lightning wouldn't hit a rod like that. Not once in a hundred years and a hundred years, Johnny, here. Thanks. What it does is clear the air of static electricity all around the place. So the lightning won't strike nearby. Yeah, that's what you and think. don't you see what you've done to him? I'll never forgive you for this. Here, Johnny. Oh, 
Now listen, Thelma Jean. Oh, Johnny, you've heard him. Well, I'm sorry, but now listen. Yeah, to you're going to be a lot more sorry. Thelma Jean. There's you... nothing you can say, listen Johnny. Listen to me. You keep him here. Keep him away from the bridge until I get back here. Come back here, Johnny. You... Just keep him there. Outside, with the aid of occasional flashes of lightning, I found my way to the concrete transformer house. There, I found out how Roger Burton, in spite of the heavy padlock on the door, had got into it. By the simple device of pulling the pins out of the hinges. And who was sitting there, waiting for me, with a thirty-eight in his hand? Close the door, mister. And back up against it. Go ahead. You... You don't give me much choice, do you? I can only tell you that if you make one move towards me, I'll pull this trigger. Your body won't be found until the annual inspection of this little transformer station. That'll be four months from now, and I'll be a long way away from here. I see. <laughs> I'll probably have to kill you anyway, mister. After I get rid of that meddling old man up on the tower, the old fool calls the bridge. Up on the tower, Burton? Yeah, I saw you drag him away from there through this window. Just before a good flash of lightning that could have been my cover-up. But don't worry. He'll be back. Hanging on to that railing, riding out the rest of the storm. And when he is... The rest of this madman's murder weapon was all too obvious now. Up at the tower, the brass railing was wired to the disconnected lightning rod. On the lower end was the copper wire I'd covered. And this end of the wire here in the blockhouse was connected to a 22,000-volt transformer. You see how it works, mister? He goes back up there and grabs hold of the rail. I throw the switch. And the power on this line will not only kill him, but melt away the copper wire. Destroy the evidence. Only nobody will look for evidence. Because they'll all think a bolt of lightning killed him. All right, Burton, listen to me. No. Look. I can see him. In the room where you carried him. And look through the window beside you. You can see him, too. I can see him all right. Starting back up the circular stairway, back up to the bridge. You think that Thelma Jean can stop him? Never! If he ever got there, if he touched the railing, Burton would throw the switch, would electrocute him. But that's a miracle. Once in a hundred years, the bolt of lightning out of the heavens. Lightning had struck the rod high up on the tower, had streaked down the wire into the blockhouse, had fairly exploded inside of it. The force had blown me out through the door, and it was a couple of hours later inside the house before I was able to move. Burton, holding the switch, had been killed instantly. I'm glad I hadn't tried to get any closer to him. It was a bolt out of the blue. It was justice in its own strange fashion. Expense account total, including a checkup by one of the local medicals, some new clothes, mine were in shreds. Incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $171.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a vicious racket that a lot of respectable people fall for, that you ought to know about. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Carlton G. Young, Ralph Moody, and James McCallion. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Jim Matthews speaking. Uh-huh.